item of business is a debate on motion 11347 in the name of Fiona Hislop on Scotland's support for the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to you and move the motion up to seven minutes please Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you and I move the motion in my name and the issue of intangible cultural heritage lies at the very heart of who we are as individuals and as members of a healthy vibrant society and it's also timely that we are discussing this important issue in 2018 which is the European Year of Cultural Heritage. Standing here in this building, redolent with its own stories, we are surrounded by the tangible remains of our nation's great cultural heritage. Holyrood Palace, Edinburgh Castle, the buildings and monuments of Carlton Hill, to name but a few. But let us reflect for, uh, for a moment on these buildings. How many of us can really say that what resonates most is the architecture, the construction techniques, the types of stone? They are important, of course, but the attraction of these buildings is just as much to do with what happened in those buildings, the stories behind the construction, the people that stayed in them, and the things that they did. And our heritage professionals are well aware of this already. When we're touring Hollywood Palace, we're invited to consider the fate of David Rizzio, allegedly at the hands of Lord Darnley, not just the final architectural details such as the, the, the Roman Doric columns and the octangle cupola of the entry gateway. Cultural heritage is not just about the physical aspects of culture, historical artifacts and building. It is also the traditions, the representations, the practices or living expressions of groups and communities. These could be enormously wide-ranging, encompassing oral traditions, performing arts and traditional crafts. The intangible aspects of our cultural heritage is hugely important. A living form of heritage which is continuously recreated, evolving as communities adapt their practices and traditions in response to their environment. It is inclusive, representative and community-based and helps to bond societies together. And I believe that uh, to be able to move forward as a nation, we must both acknowledge our roots and recognise the value of that intangible cultural heritage uh, in defining and shaping our national identity, our sense of belonging and continuity as individuals and communities. And the success of the Fish and the Gale is a, an excellent example of this for Gaelic song, story and tradition. The intangible is a critical part of how we experience our heritage, binding and connecting us to our past, our present uh, and our future. And it's of vital importance that we nurture this legacy. One of the key issues is the risk of losing our traditions and collective memory. Education is key to transmitting intangible cultural heritage practices to our children and young people. And we must continue to encourage communities and individuals within those communities to become active participants in this process. And the core aim of the UNESCO Convention is to safeguard the intangible cultural heritage as an international, national and local level. We already do much in Scotland to support uh, these overarching aims. Intangible cultural heritage is fully embedded in our place in time, the historic environment strategy for Scotland, and this defines the historic environment as a combination of physical things, the tangible, and those aspects that we cannot see, stories, traditions, and concepts, the intangible. Similarly, intangible cultural heritage uh, permeates all of the work undertaken by Historic Environment Scotland. As the lead public body for the historic environment sector in Scotland, it helps not only to curate our heritage, but to tell the stories associated with that heritage. These activities include interpretations of all kinds uh, associated with our properties and care, such as costume guides, audio guides, online interpretation and educational materials, and events and interpretation at sites. They, are also, uh, they also operate Scotland's urban past projects where communities are actively recording and creating intangible cultural heritage. And I would also like to take the opportunity to commend Museums and Galleries Scotland for its work in the area of intangible cultural heritage. That organisation became involved in this area following requests for development support uh, by Scotland's museums and galleries. And in 2007, Museums and Galleries Scotland commissioned Edinburgh Napier University to scope intangible cultural heritage in Scotland. And as a result, they developed a wiki site to capture examples of uh, intangible cultural heritage in Scotland. This site provides a place to hold information about cultural practices that happen in our communities. It's universally accessible with everyone invited to add content. And this will help build a dynamic inventory of Scotland's intangible cultural heritage practices. The site includes hugely diverse Entries, from the Merrimus Fair in Irvine to the Burryman of South Queensferry, from the extraordinary Stonehaven Fireball Festival to the stories, traditions, myths and legends that are part of the living heritage of our common ridings. 
The 2003 UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage provides a framework for working in this area. Safeguarding means ensuring the viability of the intangible cultural heritage, including identifying, protecting and promoting, as well as revitalising it. To date, 175 states from across the globe have joined the convention. Indeed, it is the fastest growing UNESCO convention. Here in Europe, 27 states from within the European Union have signed up to the convention. With the UK's non-ratification of the convention, we're clearly out of step, not only with Europe, but the world, where other governments fully recognise and acknowledge the importance of intangible cultural heritage. And critically, in not ratifying the convention, UK uh, examples of intangible cultural heritage are not eligible to be nominated for UNESCO for inclusion in the representative list. And we're, in this, we're missing out. We have many examples of intangible cultural heritage. Uh, for example, Harris Tweed, the Paisley Pattern, the Clarsac. The list is endless. And in my view, many are worthy of formal recognition and safeguarding. And consider this, in December 2017, UNESCO gave special status to the Irish Alien Pipes, which were added to the organisation's representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. And as many commentators noted at the time, this accolade not only raised awareness of the pipes as an aspect of Ireland's rich cultural heritage, but also the importance of protecting and sharing it. Of course, I very much welcome this move and congratulate our Irish friends on the inclusion of the pipes on the list. But surely Scottish piping and our contribution to the world culture through piping is worthy of recognition. It is my view that in order to fully realise the potential for intangible cultural heritage, to further engage communities and tackle equalities to help us build on the excellent work that is already underway in Scotland, the UK government must ratify the convention. Now, the Hague Convention, as referred to in the amendment, is hugely important, and many of us have been calling for many years for the UK to ratify, and it's welcome that they have now legislated. But it's taken 13 years to legislate from the UK announcing its intention to ratify in 2004. So being late to the gate with the Hague Convention cannot be used as an excuse not to sign up to the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Heritage. So, Presiding Officer, I urge members to make a clear call for the UK to sign up to the Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage and encourage them in a positive and encouraging way to do so with a single positive statement from this Parliament uh, with our, our responsibility for culture and heritage. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I call on Rachel Hamilton to speak to and move Amendment 11347.1 for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate, and Fiona Hislop will be pleased to know that this side of the benches will support the government's motion. My amendment also seeks to add a bit of meat to the bones. Intangible cultural heritage is not something that many folk have heard of, but when explained, it, its purpose clearly resonates through Scottish life and beyond. I hope that other benches recognise that the Scottish Conservatives agree that the UK Government should ratify the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage and within our motion uh, our amendment just seeks to uh, communicate the fact that the Convention not being ratified yet but which of course we hope it is, it does not mean that work has not been done on this front. Um, the UK Government has ratified a number of other UN conventions to protect cultural heritage, and these include the 1972 World Heritage Convention, the 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, the 1984 Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage, and the 1954 Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict with regulations for the executive... Exec <laughs> Execution of the Convention, excuse me. Furthermore, DCMS have also signalled plans to review whether the UK should ratify the 2001 UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. Deputy Presiding Officer, the UK not being part of the 2003 Convention has not prevented Museum and Gallery Scotland from becoming the first UK organisation to be accredited as an expert NGO advisor to UNESCO on the 2003 UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of um, ICH. And that said, there are never enough opportunities to talk about Scotland's culture. There are never enough opportunities because our culture is so rich and vibrant and diverse. And no two places are the same, from the Highlands to the Scottish borders and everywhere in between. There's a wealth of cultural experiences on offer found in dance, food, music, theatre and storytelling. 
none more so than the Scottish borders, wh which I represent, the multiple vibrant and culturally unique villages and towns found in, for example, the coastal town of Eyemouth to the common ridings in Selkirk and Hoyk, and the Civic Weeks in Coldstream and Kelso, and the countless other events like the Borders Book Festival, arts festivals and agricultural shows. And the real pleasure of all these events, of course, is the enjoyment uh, each event brings to families of those respective communities. Um, these rich cultural traditions will be passed down through generations, and this is in itself a form of protection, although it is unclear if intergenerational methods of communication are compatible. With the passing down of traditions, what is also passed down is attitudes and values, civic weeks and common writings that teach us important values, values of inclusivity and acceptance and pride in Scotland's towns and their histories. And it's fundamentally important to teach these ideals from a very early age and ingrain them within our communities. Civic Weeks have young people at its core, laddies and lassies appointed as guardians of rich tradition. In this, the Year of Young People, it's cruci crucial to acknowledge the connection that tradition has to young people. And too often there is a misconception that traditions uh, and the like are only for older persons, not for young persons. But it is the very involvement of young people in our traditions that is crucial to their longevity. The role that laddies and lasses play in Civic Weeks in the Scottish Borders demonstrates this perfectly. For the most important role is trusted to that young person, involving everyone from all ages in a week full of cultural and historical significance. The same is true, of course, for agricultural shows, where everybody gets involved uh, to get the, that uh, rosette or that trophy. Again, taking part in an experience that teaches hard work, respect and pride. Culture must remain accessible to everyone and enjoyed by everyone. And this can be done as simply as with food. And what better than sharing one's culture with food? Uh, a delicious fish supper reminds us all of Scottish haddock and our rich fishing industries. Haggis eaten across the country has us licking our lips and a cocky le leaky soup warms and comforts our souls. In a passionate pursuit to add Selkirk Ban Bannock to be part of the ICH register, it seemed that all I had to do was sign up to be a wiki contributor. And it's something that I think uh, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary might like to look at because I think that to preserve some of our traditions um, that are being passed down from older generations might be uh, using it for in, a, in an online format might be actually a little bit uh, a step too far, particularly for those generations that have traditions uh, where uh, digital technology doesn't uh, enter their lives. I'm, I'm pleased that, that yes, I will. Alistair Allen. I thank the member uh, for giving way. Will she agree that it, it is more difficult to um, convince a younger generation to take up traditions? And I'm thinking here of, in my own constituency, the Gaelic language, whenever um, politicians or people in the media deprecate that language in the media. Rachel Hamilton. Well, I think uh, what Kate Forbes is going to be doing later, while we've all got our uh, headphones here, and, and to make her speech in the Gaelic language, is going to be, do wonders uh, to promote promote that and I heard uh, Miss Forbes on GMS this morning promoting the language uh, most eloquently um, and yes I do agree uh, with Alistair Allen that it is difficult to get young people um, to be involved in traditions but my example about the common ridings in the borders is an absolute um, brilliant example because they enjoy it so much and it is just such a pride um, uh, for them so, so anyway um, so Presiding officer, I welcome this debate and support efforts to protect our culture. I, like others, hope to see the convention is ratified soon, but in the meantime, I encourage and welcome to continuing efforts to promote these local traditions like common riding, civic weeks in the Scottish borders, and of course, food. Presiding officer, Deputy Presiding Officer, I move this amendment in my name. Thank you, and I call Claire Baker for up to five minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I welcome this afternoon's debate, which gives us an opportunity to highlight the rich and tangible cultural heritage of Scotland and consider the merits of ratifying the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. Recognising, valuing, preserving and celebrating an intangible cultural heritage is important. I have raised before the evidence from the Household Survey, which points towards a growing cultural gap, which is largely linked to income. People living in our more deprived areas are less likely to engage in, participate in, and produce our country's cultural activity. 
Um, the engagement phase of the Scottish Government's cultural strategy for Scotland was published yesterday, and it also highlighted the growing feeling within the sector that this inequality does exist with regards to access and participation, some questioning if the cultural establishment is out of touch with the community and their particular issues, interests and priorities. This should be at the forefront of our thinking on culture, and we should be considering how we encourage and support greater equality and diversity. And while I recognise the value of the household survey measurements, and I do wish to see the identified cultural gap close, the value of intangible cultural heritage should be recognised for what it, often by its very nature, can involve. It is often community driven. These are skills and expressions which have often been passed from generation to generation. Its value, I would argue, has not always been recognised, which means it has not always had the support of the authorities, but has been more organic and grassroots focused. This Parliament has played a part in providing a greater focus for recognising the value of intangible cultural heritage. So intangible cultural heritage helps us share the experiences of the many communities that make up our country today and of our diverse and shared heritage. It can be democratising and it has an emotional connection to people and makes them feel that they belong to something. There is evidence to show it can reach and engage individuals and communities that can often be hard to reach. I met with the Heritage Lottery Fund this week and I was pleased to hear they provide grants and support to intangible cultural heritage recognising the value and diversity of the heritage of local and national cultures and traditions, of languages and dialects, and of people's experiences and memories. And research done by the Heritage Lottery Fund identified that young people engage more when the activity or the project is about intangible cultural heritage. And the fund also provides access to resources for grassroots community groups taking forward work in this area. While in Scotland we also benefit from support from Museums and Galleries Scotland, as other members have recognised, there is little formal infrastructure in the UK which is linked to intangible heritage. Local authorities can also be very supportive of cultural community events, but their budgets are under increasing pressure to focus on other frontline services. So what would involvement in the Convention bring to this picture? Crucially, the Convention recognises the social and economic value of intangible cultural heritage, as well as the risk for cultural elements which could disappear without help. The Convention recognises heritable, tangible objects such as monuments or collections, and also immaterial objects such as oral traditions, festival events and traditional knowledge. Now, given my earlier comments about the weakness in formal support and acknowledgement of intangible cultural heritage across the UK, Membership of the Convention means that the UK would have two obligations. First, to take necessary measures to safeguard intangible cultural heritage, and second, to identify and define, with community and expert involvement, the elements of ICH. This would mean, I think, the quite exciting prospect of creating a national inventory of ICH, and the Cabinet Secretary mentioned uh, the work already undertaken by Napier University, and also develop action plans for safeguarding the culture of the country. Not being part of the Convention doesn't stop a country doing any of this. However, being a member of the Convention means you can nominate heritage for inclusion in the Convention list. And it's fascinating to look at the two lists of the Convention. A committee meets annually to decide if something should be included on the at-risk list, the, risk, the list of urgent safeguarding, or on the representative list. And currently on the at-risk list is the whistled language from Turkey, and the representative list includes a host of crafts, celebration days, languages and traditions. So the lists serve the purpose of raising awareness, of demonstrating diversity, but they also offer the possibility of receiving UNESCO support towards its safeguarding. So one way to work in partnership with other countries to support and protect intangible cultural heritage is to ratify the Convention. And 176 countries have ratified, approved or accepted the Convention since its inception in 2003. So I would contest that our intangible cultural heritage in Scotland is in a fairly healthy state. Our heritage is a living piece of history which is constantly evolving and being recreated within our communities. It expresses a sense of identity and belonging and parts of it are thriving throughout Scotland. If the UK were to ratify the Convention, it would provide the opportunity to collectively identify and protect, as well as enabling us to raise awareness and seek support on an international stage. Thank you. Thank you. And we now move to the, to the open debate. Speeches of up to four minutes, please. And I call Ash Denham to be followed by Maurice Corey. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm obligated at this point to remind the Chamber that I am the PLO for um, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture. So UNESCO, as we've heard, provides international recognition of nations, heritage and culture. And it celebrates this diversity and reminds us of the responsibility that we have to safeguard our heritage. And what we consider today is not our nation's natural beauty, our famed artists or our influential writers, but the traditions and rituals of Scottish communities that have influenced and nurtured our culture over hundreds of years. The practices that have shaped our identity as a nation. Now, the Scottish Government recognises the value of intangible culture, and we've heard today some of the important ways that it's already safeguarded here in Scotland. But the UK Government's failure to ratify the UNESCO Convention means that Scotland's world-renowned culture misses out on some of the international recognition that other cultures are able to secure. There is recognition for violin makers in Italy, beer brewing in Belgium, cowbell crafting in Portugal, and even bagpipe culture in Slovakia. Um, so the fact that for Scotland, we are unable to put forward our traditions and practices to be considered for inclusion onto the international representative list, I think really sells Scotland's culture short. With summer swiftly approaching, I thought I would take the opportunity to draw attention to a couple of Scottish seasonal practices. The halfway point between the spring equinox and the summer solstice towards the end of April was held by the Celtic people of Scotland to be a particularly special time of year, possessing regenerative powers and bestowing springtime fertility. They celebrated this transition at the ancient uh, Gaelic festival of Beltane, where they would drive cattle through bonfires, bestowing protective powers over them before they were led to their summer pastures. And this ritual was practiced up until about the 19th century, a period of over a thousand years. Equally significant was the first water of Beltane, supposed to hold especially potent powers. To wash oneself in it was supposed to bring health and happiness, and so established the tradition of washing oneself in the May Day dew. And I am pleased to report that my constituency holds Scotland's most famous location for this tradition, which is Arthur's Seat. For hundreds of years, Scots have climbed Arthur's Seat to catch the sunrise and to wash themselves in the dew in the hope that it will bestow everlasting youth. And I must admit at this point, I am quite tempted. While I'm unsure though of the mythical powers of the May Day Dew, I'm certain of the lasting powers of these Celtic traditions. And it's incredible that hundreds of years after the original practice, we still celebrate the coming of the summer months here in Scotland. And if you wish, you can join um, those celebrating Beltane Festival on Calton Hill in between the flames, or you can take a dawn stroll to the top of Arthur's Seat to wash your face in the dew. And while the rituals themselves have evolved and adapted, I'm not sure if cows are still welcome on Calton Hill, we can see the way in which Celtic tradition still influences our modern culture. And it's for this reason that the Scottish Government is quite right to acknowledge and celebrate the central importance of intangible cultural her heritage to Scottish culture. And it's for this reason that I'm very happy to support this motion. And I know that the Scottish Government has repeatedly called on the UK Government to ratify the UNESCO Convention, but I hope that they will really take note of this debate here today in the Scottish Parliament and the calls that are coming from Scotland from across the many political parties represented here today, and that the UK Government will listen to this and um, it will consider ratifying it as soon as possible. Thank you. I call Mordis Corey to be followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak today in this debate. Uh, preserving our cultural heritage is something that we need to hold in high regard because of the great pride we take in our oldest customs and traditions. By preserving our heritage, we can maintain the diversity among our communities and highlight traditions that have enriched our cultures throughout our history. Usually when we think of intangible cultural heritage, we think of things like language, customs and tradition, but it spans far beyond. Artifacts, objects and instruments are the physical pieces of intangible cultural heritage that can most easily be protected through institutions like museums. Other sorts of intangible cultural heritage are a bit harder to protect. Maintaining traditions and events can be a challenge in the 21st century. It requires the public to remain engaged and interested in the tradition as well as ensuring that they will be funded. 
Although the UK government has not ratified the 2003 Convention, Museums and Galleries Scotland has been working hard towards achieving the goals set out in the Convention. And Museums and Galleries Scotland has achieved this through the creation of a log of traditions. This log includes events, foods, craft and many other traditions practiced in Scotland. And I firmly believe that the Highland Games are a crucial facet of our heritage and this needs protection. The games can be traced back to the 14th century with the series Games in Fife, which will please Willie Rennie. Uh, back then, the games were used as a means to establish who were the strongest and the bravest of the soldiers in Scotland and to show off artistic and musical talents. And since then, the games have become an integral part of the Scottish cultural scene recognised around the world. And I welcome today in the public gallery Don Campbell from the Scottish Highland uh, Games Association and also Robert McIntyre, chairman of the Rosenies Peninsula Highland Games in my West Scotland region. Welcome to you, gentlemen. Today, the games continue each, day, each year, keeping up traditional events such as shot put and caber toss, along with artistic impressions, expressions through traditional music and dance, with graded competitions which attracts participants of all ages. Each year, the games draw thousands of visitors to Scotland, contributing to local economies and spreading knowledge of our culture. The games allow us to share this heritage to both a global and local audience. And keeping these games running is a struggle, through, though for many, for many uh, the struggle though for many smaller communities including one in my region of which I've spoken before. Each year they are struggling more and more to meet the financial demands of running the games. For many communities the Highland Games are the biggest event of the year and attract the most visitors to the area so it's vital that these small communities and to these small communities that the games go on. As most are volunteer-run events as well, uh, the ability to access sponsorship and funding is dependent purely upon their knowledge. Many Highland Games organizers struggle to access funding and also to support, so that I would be interested to hear from the Cabinet Secretary how, about how we could better support the Highland Games organizers. The Games are so important to Scottish culture as a whole that we, I would argue that the importance they have to each individual community is critical in defining each community and in stimulating a robust local economy, as indeed my colleague Rachel Hamilton referred to about the borders. Um, by involving several levels of public sector, from government to Visit Scotland to Scottish athletics, there is much potential to empower small communities to host their Highland Games. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Highland Games today provide us with a chance to protect our intangible cultural heritage that surpasses the conservation of old pieces of art in a museum. The Highland Games gives us a way to continue a tradition that has been in our culture for centuries and allows us to pay respect to our past. So we must do what we can to support and protect them in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Johan Lamont to be followed by Kate Forbes. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I say that I'm very happy to participate in this debate. They do say that every day is a school day. And I, for one, have already learned a great deal more about what, in fact, is the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage than I did before the beginning of the debate. But I was starting, I have to confess, from a very low base. And it seems to me there's a simple division in the chamber that we endorse this convention now or we endorse it later. And that doesn't really feel to me as if there's a huge amount of disagreement. And I think there's a huge amount that we can agree on. Um, R Rachel Finlay. Thank you for taking the intervention. Um, so far, we've heard from um, two sides, three sides of benches, but and it also it seems like we are supportive of um, getting the UK government to um, hurry up and to ratify the convention. So I'm not sure where that information is coming from. Johan Lamont. I, I was, maybe I was misreading the motion which said that you want to do certain things before you endorse it. It doesn't matter. I think I'm absolutely convinced and com committed to the idea of endorsing the convention, but also that we go beyond that and try to understand then if we do want to support our um, intelligible cultural heritage, what, does, what challenges that represent for us beyond simply endorsing the convention itself. So I just want to make some observation. I don't pretend to be any kind of expert in, in this. It's almost like the political equivalent of thinking aloud. So forgive me for that. Um, but I, some ob observations I might have about this process. I think, first of all, there needs to be an understanding of what is intangible. For me, Gaelic is not intangible. The Gaelic language is all too tangible and the policy choices that resulted in my generation losing the language were entirely tangible. So I think we have to be careful about that. I was the first person to speak in a debate, in debate in the chamber, in the language of my forebears in Gaelic, and made the point then 
about the way in which choices had been made that meant that all too many, certainly of my generation, lost the language. And I would support initiatives across um, government that actually revive the Gaelic language. Or perhaps it is that we, what we're seeking here is we open up an understanding and a valuing of culture um, and stop defining the intangible against it. So there's a mainstream culture and everything else is intangible. I don't think that is what's intended, but I think it does mean that we should be challenging our notion of what cultural Scottish culture is um, and recognise just how diverse it is. I also would caution against defining too tightly what intangible culture is. There is the joy of the vast range of cultural experiences, the diversity of poetry, song, music, dance across our communities. And trying to put it in a box, in my view, can be counterproductive. We know what it is. Let's not spend too long killing ourselves with definitions. And I can think of many examples of the riches of the culture into which I was born, a culture of humour, of understanding the elements, of the daily battle um, of working against the elements and shaped by the land on which people worked. That shaped the people of that land, a culture of shenichus, of storytelling, of caling. But of course, the people did not think they were taking part in it. They were simply living it. And I think that is the way we should see it. I recall as a child um, how far away that Gaelic culture that I was born into, um, thriving in the fireside, by the fireside in Anderson and Glasgow, alive at the hearth in my family's croft, how far that life felt from what was presented as a Gaelic culture through the television, how far even the more the Gaelic institutions felt from the cultural experience we had. And I congratulate, I know the minister said this, the fish movement for making live and visible my experience of the Gaelic language and culture and music and drama and song that has now been the opportunity for a younger generation that perhaps um, we were denied. So in conclusion, um, I want to think about the way in which we have, we capture our own history, our oral traditions across a whole range of cultures. The Edinburgh University Scottish Studies Department, I think it is, did a wonderful little project capturing the voices of people from Tyree in the 80s. And I'm sure that is replicated in other places as well. We need to ensure they were investing in these little projects, the storytelling project in the southwest of Glasgow, another example of capturing that range of voices in diversity. And I think, therefore, in supporting the convention, there should be a commitment to ensuring the little bits of funding, the little bits of work that can make a massive difference in celebrating the vast, the vast range of cultures across this country. Uh, thank you. Before we move on to Kate Forbes, um, who's giving the the last contribution in the open debate. Uh, can I draw members' attention to the headphones that are on your desk? Because Kate Forbes will be making her contribution in Gaelic. And interpretation facilities are available. So if you, I feel like I'm on, I was about to just do all the demonstrations. I won't do that. <laughs> you can plug your headphones in to the, the little socket at, at the base of the console. And uh, if you're unable to hear it, you should press the audio button on the console screen and select channel two in English. And I call on Kate Forbes, please. Tap live. Va ui vor akum sin jespitoris gask and the hurmi taik re immersed in your UNESCO yangalic inuri. Be biak ian vich glodge nach mari nebaun in your UNESCO ein er son kulter. Dwoches ag ishaun nos nan gael, sa mar chainichen er ian mach glodge inimi in orad sho. Ha inive UNESCO a kielachach can be inive intangible cultural heritage ek egalik, ag is ha shin a kielachach can be doi eile aun ar canan kiol ag is dwoches a ian er son ina ginyali. Ha egalik a fosglach doris gu shalach eile er ar suol, a torshgain tukshe nas kolente er ar nyachtri es ar kulter agis jalov nas salire er na haroin ha biarstas e chan en kurta er in chir agis ha en ad glestnas gain uk di ga gien yes um am vel am bau ugud tachach guvel ama guvel gugu Er Gaelic na halapa akurina sherevision ida chedeche achga. 
Kate Forbes. Hag and Chekov, as Hag Mathi Mulnur ha Orage Akadri Skrivach, Sigalak, your son Jespit, Savarlamich. Ha in a UNESCO, a Kielachoch, um, can be, can be doi ela aking, um, Gaelic a yean, your son and a Ginelli, Marahurshmi. Ach, han yel korum aking in dras the Marahurst a Vinister, in dras the Egalic ein, er lister UNESCO, Lishnachel Realtus. Na riach unichje a gun to chuchlish. Agus hamisha Gianov na horet shaw sigalic er son da over. Sihiatache, Hanyelagalin, a Gaelic canon, ar nyachtri, evan. Ha Gaelic bio, ha bio a mes scholarin, coir schnachgen, parentin, agus nemianin, popoloch, an glassahu, agus an sigeltoch. Alistair Allen. Tapeloid. I will a Malagun to call a room, sir. Gre Arakamich, my phone, your hound, the Hashan Clinging, Ryan Gown, Nahil Kutchigan, a muggy in the Gaelic, as hat a muggy, doing your clerk in the Gaelic, it's so you can raj Augustan Fulham. Kate Forbes. Oh, I miss a nine Harakamich and Shin, em, Gu Jerev, Agus Gunchikov, Agus Shin Unge and Hoover and Hammy Clacha Gallic, Sepharlamich and Jew, is Gaskavan me a giddy shelf in Gavel Dunya Clacha Nagalic, Amsafar, Amsafarlamich, had the Clacha Gallic Nesculchin, had the Clacha Gallic Sequoyerstochen, Agus Hagama female Gavelshin has a Clacha Gallic in Jew. Hanyami Irson is Shesavin Shaw, Sabrine Mungalic, Margre Canon, Marav Ehinche, Gujerav Shishin and Uver, a ye machine, a Gian, Le Inneva Unesco. Hator Yefer Royan Fractikuch, Erson, Ardochus Agus Arcanon, a Yen, and Biachse, Habachorgain, a Vijelegrish, a Gallic, Marudigan, and a Titaski. Get a ruling a Gallic, Imadach, Bullechrui, Alms Neblianichin, a Yalav. Ha i bio has, mar hurst, a vinister. Agis a gurachoch, mar canon, some be ele. Agis verig inver unesco, taich rishen amis, aking ule, ule hamien dochis, aking a via lessachuch, ne gallic, agis gan yarstachuch, er son in arm richach. Agis shin and darn a uver, a hamie genuine nohorid shaw, sigalic. Givel me er son a shout and yarahula dunya. Ek nachel fis mer ha, ho prisho sa hai, agis ganem shina vi er a korachuch le inneve offigal bo UNESCO. Harans a chuch immer schnegeltach a shalting, gewel loch, kiet keret ne milian nocht ans a galic, do the economy ne halapa gach bliene, agis a shin mir veloch, agis a vele kirscht a vi a brin, ma loch ne galic. Mara Helshin ga clachkoch, Gutri, Bishin a breen mungalic, Marutigan fale, Bishin a breen mungalic, Gunnavi a breen sugalic. In Blianese, she Bliana a nohoigri a haum, Agis Gunchekov, Hanohoigri, Snefation, Marahurst em Boil Ela, a Jedavahog, em Gavel, Kyol Gaeloch has bio. Donald Cameron. A veli a gunta go groom, gave na fashion, a cajion, er a dolcus, a gahari yan feyan oka. Kate Forbes. A ha gun chick of mar kuchkin mar mihin se, em yunsich mihin gallic tro, fan torvian a gallic. I guess va koramakinye, a vi a gunsuch ma kyols kulter sul kalele, em ansa gallic tro na fashion. Sagama. Female, er son doing ek a vel gallic, I guess good er son scholar in ek nachel a gallic, a vig yunsuch, vami em on nard skull in shach and sahai, svat the fine of kishin mun gallic, get nach roet em em filinte se gallic. I guess lishishin, maha yolis er ar nyachtri, vere gain shalach na shar er na haroin, I guess marshin, ha a gallic, loch vor, I guess kutremach gain ule, more than Tapalif. And uh, can I say to everyone, if you wish to hear the, the rest of the debate clearly, assuming the rest of it is in English, if you would remove the microphones uh, from your consoles. Sorry, the headphones from the microphones in the consoles. And we now move to closing speeches. Now, call Willie Rennie, four minutes, please.
Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. It is an honour, actually, to follow Kate Forbes and her accomplished contribution this afternoon. She delivered it with great style, and I'm sure everybody appreciated uh, what she has done. I think she's probably done an awful lot more for the Gaelic language today than this Parliament's done uh, for some time. It's a special thing that we must protect, cherish and encourage. Uh, Visit Scotland conducted uh, a valuable experiment a few years ago. They gave some diaries to, to some tourists um, who were visiting Scotland and they asked them to write down what they experienced. And of course they wrote down about the, the castles and the mountains and the glens and the cathedrals and the fine architecture. But more often, they wrote about the stories that they heard from the locals. They heard about what Mary had experienced, the fact that her family was born and brought up in the community, where they were born, the stories of their ancestors. They talked about Jimmy, who took them to the pub to sing along with the songs in the local pub. Those were the kind of experiences that these tourists cherished most. And sometimes, actually looking to what other people see about us, is actually truly who we are. And I think that was a, a reflection, a valuable experiment from Visit Scotland. And that's why I think it is important that we do recognise intangible heritage like that, the stories, the experiences, our lifestyle. And that's why I sign up, and I think the UK government should sign up to the convention before too much longer. I'm grateful to, to Maurice Corey for his contribution this afternoon about the Highland Games. Serious Highland Games in my constituency are the oldest games in Scotland. They were established 700 years ago following the Battle of Bannockburn. Robert the Bruce himself granted a charter to hold the games in appreciation of the support from the locals in the, from the village for that battle. And the games are still an incredibly popular event today. They're held in the natural amphitheatre in the village and are special because I think of two things. One, they attract visitors from all over the world, Americans, Brazilians, Australians, Chinese. They mix, they rub shoulders with the locals who often come back to share the stories of their lives when they've gone further afield. They've lived somewhere else. They come back to the village on an annual basis to share that cultural, that intangible culture, those stories from previous, year, from previous years. And it's that eclectic mix that I think makes it successful. So how do we support the Highland Games, which are not just in Cirrus, but also in over 60 other places across the country? And if you add on the Borders Games, then you've got even more of these kind of traditional games that take part. You've got the heavies, you have the dancers, you have the athletes, but you also have the, um, the cyclists too. I think there's two or three things that we can do to support it. One, do more of what Visit Scotland doing to get more athletes, sorry, more um, tourists to come um, to these games. And Visit Scotland did a grand job of promoting um, the Highland Games. But we also need to encourage Scottish athletics to do even more, to get more runners, athletes to take part in the games as well. But the final thing, I think we need to provide some financial support, some seed corn funding for the games, because sometimes it's particularly challenging and difficult with the new regulations. Um, that are in place to make these games thrive. And that's why I think a small grant scheme to support the Highland Games, to make them grow, to make them flourish, is exactly what we should be doing. So I would encourage Fiona Hislop to consider that in her summing up, to provide a small grant scheme to make the Highland Games the best that they possibly can be. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Claire Baker up to four minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. It's been a very interesting, if short, debate. We'll be supporting the Government motion, and it would be good to see a unified position coming from Parliament. The Conservative amendment today does sound very similar to the reply that Lord Ashton in the House of Lords gave last April, um, but I do welcome that this afternoon they have confirmed that they are supportive of ratification. So the UNESCO Convention, um, I think, has been laid out by members this afternoon where there are strong arguments for us to be made for ratifying. Um, Ash Denham argued that Scottish culture loses out at the moment, but I, I recognise that, but I'd also recognise that it, 
if we were to ratify it, it would benefit the whole of the UK. And we have a rich history across the whole of the UK, whether it's Lancashire clog dancing or it's folk music or on and on. So I think there'd be benefits across um, the whole of the country. I just want to say a slight word about um, Brexit. There is consideration to be given about how culture will operate on an international stage post-Brexit. And the Chamber's familiar with concerns around freedom of movement and access to European cultural funds. I think joining the Convention would demonstrate our commitment to cooperative working on an international stage within culture. Uh, members have also given local examples from their region or their constituencies. Uh, Rachel Hamilton made points about how the list is created, whether it should be self-selecting. If we were to ratify, I think that would give a formal process to it that would be of benefit. Um, some people have mentioned the role of young people and the importance of education, and I think that was a, a well-made point. In this age of globalisation, how do we continue interest from generation to generation? Uh, Morris Corey and Willie Rennie both raised Highland Games um, and spoke about the struggle for, some vol for volunteers and for financial support for the Games, recognising the importance of them to Scotland, but also recognising their challenges. Uh, Willie Rennie offered some solutions to that that I think would be worth pursuing, but as I said in the opening statement, our local authorities have often played a big role in supporting these type of events and they are under significant funding pressure. Um, Joanne Lamont made the point around uh, people's understanding of what is intangible, that sometimes I think the language we're using doesn't really help um, in what we're trying to explain to people. Uh, and she also talked about challenging our notion of what culture is. And in the opening statements I made around, you know, I think the intangible cultural heritage is more linked to communities, is more linked to grassroots. And I think it would widen out what our understanding of um, culture is. Now, a lot of members spoke about Gaelic, and the Convention does provide the opportunity to protect traditions that are at risk of being lost. And when the Parliament was first established, I can remember there were real concerns that Gaelic was a fading language. And it certainly still needs support, but we are in a much healthier place for survival and even flourishing of the language. And Kate Forbes made a strong case that it is a living and even expanding language. But whilst Gaelic has still been spoken, for many it is no longer their first language. And as generations pass on, there are concerns that the traditions linked to Gaelic, such as the stories and the Psalms, will be at risk. And Joanne Lamont's um, speech today, which talked about her experience of growing up uh, with Gaelic, I think were perceptive and, and insightful. And I think it does recognise the challenges we have in trying to capture what is um, important. And I heard on the radio uh, this week there was a discussion about Doric and how to preserve Doric as a language. Um, however, in the Chamber this afternoon, we can all make cases for what should be uh, what, what we could put into the list and what should be um, preserved. But ratifying the Convention would provide a way to curate this and a framework for protection. But it would also be for the committee of the Convention to decide what is um, to be included in their, under their criteria. And it's, it's not an expansive list. So I think we would need you know, a, a UK and a, a Scottish list to sit alongside what we would argue for to be within the Convention. Uh, the final point I'd really quickly make is around the Napier report, which the, presiding of, which the Cabinet Secretary mentioned. Um, there is an area there around the, the pressure it puts on to um, some of our cultural festivals. And you know, I think there's a risk, there has been identified, there's a risk of us losing the things that are actually important. So if we look at Hogmanay, Hogmanay has become a big commercial um, festival, which is important to our tourism. But the traditions in Scotland are around first footing, around lumps of coal. In my family, it was around opening the back door to let out the old year and open the front door to let the new year in. In Fife, it was always known as Old Year's Night, not Hogmanay. So I just think, you know, some of these, when a time of globalisation, there is a need to maintain cultural diversity and being part of the convention could help us forward in that. So now, I have been guilty of allowing this debate to run on a bit, and I don't want it to affect the next debate too quickly, so I would ask the last two speakers if they could be kind and perhaps cut down a little bit. Brian Whittle, followed by, of course, Cabinet Secretary. Good luck with that, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I, um, <laughs> I'm delighted to close uh, this debate today on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. In fact, I've got to be honest with you, I'm, I'm quite relieved to be at the end of this debate because I, I have thought long and hard as to the nature of intangible heritage and culture, and, and I, quite, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Um, and as Joanne Lamont uh, has said, every day is a school day. And I, I, I do like the definition I found there that uh, intangible cultures is, is works through which uh, creativity of people find expression, because that gives me latitude to mention whatever I like. And, and music, uh, uh, for me, everything from uh, my very favorite bagpipe piece of Highland Cathedral right through to that little old rock band from Glasgow, ACDC. Now, I know we're all thunderstruck here, Deputy Presiding Officer, but in there lies the beauty of intangible. 
How far back do we have to go to claim culture? And I think sport has to lie in there too. And how about Bonspiel, a traditional curling tournament usually held on a frozen lake and can last up to two or three days over a weekend. Uh, about, and, and who remembers playing elastics in the school playground? I think health and safety would have a field day with that one, uh, but, but I would like to see that one brought back again. And it's been mentioned today by Morris Corey and Willie Rennie, but I'm glad they did this. They brought in Highland Games, which I fondly remember during uh, my early athletics career, uh, getting on the ferry, going to Brodick, running on a 300 metre track on a hillside on a golf course. And if you could get your stride pattern right, you could actually land in all the little hillocks and run faster than everybody else. And I was glad to see Fiona Hislop bringing up Minimass Fair in Irvine, which has once again had a great uh, Highland, uh, Highland Games uh, uh, tradition. I will give way to it. Willie Rennie. Uh, he would be an amateur at that time. Was the, has he got any declarations to make about any prize money that he won at these games? <laughs> Brian Mitchell. Can I thank Willie Rennie for that intervention? <laughs> you, you're absolutely correct. There was no prize. Some of the things we actually used to win were we won these little, uh, uh, little China birds things, the, the things that you never ever use in your, your entire life. I don't know where they got the things from. But uh, I, no, I have no declaration to make, certainly not to you, Mr. Rennie. Um, I do, uh, I do uh, 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 echo your call, I think, for, for Scottish athletics to, to maybe uh, look at bringing more athletes to the Highland Games because it's an, it's an experience, I think, uh, that is beginning to be lost and actually uh, really helped to shape some of, some of my, my previous. Um, I, 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 I will skip over some of them, but I wanted to spe uh, specifically talk about things like stone skimming or even TIG. And is, does that lie within intangible culture? Uh, and coming from God's own country, Deputy Presenting Officer, it would be remiss of me, uh, an Ayrshire boy. I wondered if our great uh, bard, Rabbi Burns, would fall into this category. Certainly his works have been interwoven into my life from an early age. And I remember in Troon Primary uh, 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 reciting that the, the king came riding through the tune, slaying stately through the tune. He booed to left and he booed to right, and we booed back as we'll be micked. But we Jack Tog, he couldn't abide because he was daft to be doing at the water side. Ach, we Jock Todd. Troon Primary School, 1975, running up Bonds competition. Wait. Now, that, um, that early education has followed me right through my life, and I often pass by Bonds' cottage in Ayrshire and, and the old Kirk, which it spawned Tam O'Shanter, and Suter Johnny's cottage, which I pass often in my uh, MSP travels. However, speaking at this end of this debate, I have been able to listen to a variety of inputs into the chamber. I do want to highlight Kate Forbes' uh, uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful to hear her speak in Gaelic, which is such a wonderful lyrical language, uh, as she says, a, a living, breathing language. And just to say, my youngest daughter actually is at a school where Gaelic is, is taught, I'm, I'm glad to say, which was, I thought was fantastic. I think not all cultures necessarily ha uh, should be resurrected. I think Ash Denham uh, talking about belting and driving cattle through uh, bonfires is maybe something that we should leave consigned to the history books. Um, and, uh, I, 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 and Rachel Hamilton made a very good point uh, uh, in, in that uh, in, during the common ridings in the borders, that uh, passing on attitudes and values, that sort of integ uh, integration of, of, of uh, incompatibility with, uh, with the young and old, I think is extremely, uh, extremely important. I did want to speak to Claire Baker, saying that she you mentioned that maybe that social background may be a barrier uh, to cultural heritage. And I'm not, I'm not convinced of that, to be honest, because I think it might be a, diff a different cult. I'm, I'm in my last half minute. No, he won't. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Because you only have to listen to the, to, to, the, to the musings of that great poet, Billy Connolly, to, to get a, a view into that world and that different culture. So I think the safeguarding and maintaining of Scotland's intangible cultural heritage is incredibly important and I believe lies with all of us in our communities, in our schools and in our homes, passing it on. So don't try and define it because it, the title of this debate tells you that it can't. What we should do is enjoy it, revel in it and pass it on. Deputy Presiding Officer. It's intangible how long Mr. Fritchell speaks when you ask him to do so quickly. <laughs> and I call uh, Fiona Hislop to wind up the debate, Cabinet Secretary. Please, uh, up, up to six minutes, but no uh, more. Yeah, thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this has been a short debate, but it's also been an important debate. And today's debate is the latest in a, a recent series of strategic discussions about this issue. Last November, I chaired the Strategic Historic Environment Forum, which considered uh, intangible cultural heritage. The forum noted not only the amount of good work that was already been taken forward, but also the many organisations throughout Scotland with a keen interest in intangible cultural heritage. Um, I also was pleased to hear of the Cross-Party Group on Cultures welcome 
consideration of the issue in November of this year. Uh, turning to some of the contributions in the debate, maybe I should declare an interest. Uh, Deputy President Officer, I'm currently Chieftain of West Lothian Highland Games, and I would like to formally invite both Brian Whittle and Willie Rennie to the Hill Race of West Lothian Highland Games that will be taking place in a few months' time. Um, I, reflecting on some of the points that were made, Claire Baker, uh, in a very considered speech, set out the clear explanation of the obligations. And I would point out that one of my concerns of why the UK hasn't signed up to date was they, they thought that somehow it would open the floodgates of costs and requests. But of course, we then had that both from Willie Rennie and Maurice Corrie in relation to the Highland Games. Now, there have previously been discussions, and I will ask uh, Event Scotland to engage in that again, but I don't think we should put the issue of instant demands for funding uh, in the way of understanding what the wider uh, obligations are of the Convention. Ash Denham talked about the Celtic traditions and belting. I know of people who have washed their faces uh, the presiding officer uh, may be one of them who has washed their face uh, at Arthur's feet. But these Celtic traditions tell us much about our stories and they need to be expressed as well. I think Joanne Lamont's uh, reflections, as was Kate Forbes, on the importance of Gaelic language and importantly the traditions and the living traditions and the developing traditions of Gaelic are very important indeed. And I think she reflected that there perhaps isn't that much disagreement in terms of what we're trying to achieve here. I, I do think the amendment is probably unnecessary a commentary because we want a clear simple statement. I'm not saying I'm demanding that they sign up tomorrow. I would like them to do that, but I do think it's something that would be a very strong statement, and I welcome um, Rachel Hamilton's reflections of, of the need to help uh, the UK understand the importance of signing this up, uh, signing up to this uh, convention. I'd also like to inform the Chamber that I discussed the issue in Paris earlier this month with Mr Nguida, the Deputy Director General of UNESCO. I assured him that even without the UK's ratification of the convention, intangible cultural heritage was strongly supported by the Scottish Government. We also agreed on the tremendous scope to use modern means, including digital technology, to celebrate intangible cultural heritage. He expressed a keen interest in today's debate, and I agreed to inform Mr Nguida about the issues that were raised in the Chamber this afternoon. And it's significant to note that UNESCO is interested in what is happening here in Scotland, and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we have much to share with the world in the area of intangible cultural heritage. Not simply in the examples that we have um, that are part of our everyday lives, but also how we approach the subject. For example, uh, the Intangible Cultural Heritage in Scotland wiki site, which was developed by Museums Gallery Scotland, was copied by Norway and Finland as best practice with other in nations interested in learning from that example. So I, I would again congratulate everybody involved in the initial development of the site. So against this backdrop, it seems to me that the time is right for the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament to call for the UK Government to ratify the Convention. And indeed, it may be the case that the UK Government's ratification of the 1954 Hague Convention for the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict that took place last year, uh, it, came, it signals a, a real and meaningful shift in the UK UK government's approach to culture within the wider international context. And I would like to reassure the Conservatives that that was the impression that I received from the UK ambassador to UNESCO uh, when I met him in Paris. So I believe it is important to promote and safeguard our cultural practices, our living traditions for this and future generations. So it is in that generous, encouraging and positive spirit that I think this chamber can come together, I think preferably with a simple motion. I understand and reflect the commentary from the Conservatives, but I don't think it's necessary in order to, keep, to communicate our message. And it is in that context that I would urge this chamber, this chamber with our responsibilities for culture and heritage, to call upon the UK government to ratify the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. And I ask the members to support the motion. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And that concludes the debate on Scotland's support for the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. I'll give some seconds for seats to be shifted.